Loafs around. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh. Social distance. So, look, six feet apart. <laughs> I'm Gazina. I am a guest instructor at King Arthur Flower, and I have a little baking school here. And that was Ray. He's doing the filming. And, and I'm Jeffrey. Uh, I've been a baker since I started baking at 6 a.m. Wednesday morning, September 1st, 1976. And I think it's a career. At 6.02, I said, this is the work for me, and I've been doing it ever since, and I deeply love the work. And my hope is that over these coming weeks, um, I can help you become a better baker because there is an immense fulfillment from taking two loaves of bread out of the oven, as much fulfillment as if you're taking 200 or 500 loaves of bread out of a production bakery oven. So mm -hmm. hopefully you'll find a lot of that fulfillment as we go on. Well, and also, as long as you're isolating, we're here to help you bake. Because uh, I find that we both get a lot of joy from teaching, and mm -hmm. we were meant to be teaching these next few weeks. And uh, the first thing I thought when everything shut down and I knew I couldn't be teaching, I said, I went to the grocery stores and there was, there's no flour anywhere, there's no yeast. And I thought our people are doing what they need to do for their own therapy. <laughs> So I thought, you know what the world needs? The world needs Jeffrey right now because there's so many people who bought flour and yeast because it's very elemental and they don't know what to do with it. So it's, I know it's been sitting in your cupboard and now you're cursing it because it's not a bag of chips <laughs> because you're like, I don't know what to do. So Jeffrey, you're so kind for agreeing to do this with me because I think your shepherding of bakers new and experienced, I will not say old, uh, will be so helpful and I love this first recipe which is the no need six-fold French bread I've been making it all week and I've been making it all week just to familiarize I, I kept saying I'm familiarizing myself with the recipe I kept making it every day because it shepherded me through the day mm -hmm. just touching the dough and baking with it was nurturing and I really needed that. And so every half hour I was like, I was looking forward to that half hour getting my hands in the mm. dough. Let's go. So let, this is Jeffrey's no need six fold French bread. And the ingredients are gonna be coming up in one second. Ray's gonna tap a button so that you can see them. And as we're going on, I'm going to be looking for your questions and to asking Jeffrey for you. So Jeffrey? Okay, here we go. So the most basic ingredients for bread are flour, water, salt, and yeast. And that's what we have here. Flour, water, dry yeast, instant dry yeast, and salt. We're gonna make a bread that really doesn't demand much of anything in terms of fancy equipment, big sophisticated ovens or anything like that. We can all do this in our kitchen. So flour, salt and yeast. Um, this is my big tool that I'm going to be using. And first I'll just quickly intersperse the salt with the yeast. Jeffrey, is that instant yeast? It's instant yeast, yep. Now, if someone can only find the rapid rise, not instant, can they do exactly what you're doing. Uh, rapid rise, unfortunately, it does just what it says. It rises real quick, but then it peters out. Okay. So active dry or instant dry are far and away the better choices. Um, as far as flour goes, the most important thing is to use unbleached flour. Um, and again, the shelves are bare throughout the country. So if you can find a bag of unbleached flour, get it okay so I uh, here I have all four ingredients and now I'm going to take my white scraper and I'm just going to start dragging the water over the flour if you don't have one of these white scrapers maybe you have a flexible piece of plastic somewhere in your home and you can fashion a scraper that would do the same job so again I'm trying to show you something that has very minimal needs for equipment so you, right now you're using unbleached, um, all-purpose flour. Yep, that's if right. someone can only find bread flour, 
Red would flour is fine. Exactly the same thing. Would they have to add a little more water or? Possibly. Possibly. But if we're talking to entry level people, we want to be careful that we don't start advising, right. you know. We're not being macho and say, how much water can you get but into you're the macho. dough? Be macho, Jeffrey. I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, here are the important things at this phase. Once I've got the water more or less wetting all the flour, I'm going to start a kneading stroke. One of the things I like very much about this dough is that it never leaves this bowl until it's time to divide it. So when it's at about at this point, I'm just going to go with the scraper to the back side of the bowl, pull the dough up and kind of stretch it over the surface. Rotate the bowl 20 to 25 percent so you're working up a new portion of the dough and just repeat that process. I'm going to do this roughly 20 to 25 times. The important things are that when I'm done with this initial mixing that all the flour has been hydrated. If I've got little bits of dry flour, those will resist hydrating and you'll have little rocks of flour in your finished loaf. So you want to avoid that. And this is the first uh, fold of the six fold. This is the first fold right. of the six fold. Okay. So that's about 20 strokes or so. And I think I've got all the flour wet. So I'm just going to scrape the sidewall so that everybody gets into the party. I'll scrape this off here. I might pick this up and make sure there's no flour visible on the bottom. I think it looks okay. Now, notice how when I pull on this dough, it just shreds apart. There is absolutely zero resistance when I tug on it. It just shreds apart. That's because the dough hasn't developed its strength or its glutinous properties. So that's going to happen for, for two reasons. One, we're going to repeat this folding technique every 30 minutes and that's going to significantly increase the strength. And secondly, the mere act of time is a very effective way to strengthen the dough. So this, I don't want to get down the sink. I have a, I have a. I yeah, saw that, but I want to show people there. another way of cleaning your hands. Take a little bit of flour, rub it all over your doughy hands. By all means, don't get that dough down your sink unless you've got a really good plumber. Okay, so now I will go and wash my hands and discard this. I could sift this and use the flour, but I'm just going to discard it. And Gazino? Yes, I'm here. There was one question I thought that was interesting. If somebody sees a yeast that's labeled for pizza crust, can they use that? Are there, th I've if it's never instant? If it's instant, it should be fine. Okay. Again, the only one you want to really avoid is the rapid rise. That's what we're avoiding. But now that we have to let that rest, so between fold, it's 30 minutes. The process for that is three hours total, right? Yep. And I'm telling you, it's, it is so lovely every half hour to have something to look forward to. And I put my little alarm, my Alexa on, and she gently beeps to tell me it's time that I get to play with the dough. But that's three hours, and then another hour or so for, for shaping, right? And then you have to proof. So it's a nice stretch of day. So I wanted to show you a recipe that is really zippy. So this will take minutes, literally. And my tiny ones only took 12 minutes in the oven. And the difference between this kind of quick bread and a yeasted bread is that it is literally quick. So Jeffrey is making his no need bread with instant yeast. And that needs time. It needs time to develop. It's creating these lovely, lovely bubbles. It's gassing so that it's rising. It's also creating flavor. Quick breads, on the other hand, are literally quick because they use baking powder or baking soda. There is a difference only in that baking powder also has a few other ingredients combined, an acid and sometimes cornstarch. Uh, someone had asked me, what if I don't have baking powder? Because this requires a tablespoon of baking powder. 
If you do have baking soda and cream of tartar, you can take a teaspoon of that baking soda and two teaspoons of the cream of tartar, which is an acid. Unless you have an acid, it won't activate. Other things, sometimes you'll see a recipe and I'll ask for vinegar or buttermilk, and that is the acid, molasses too, in chocolate chip cookies, because it has the baking soda. That is that slight acid that allows it to go, go poop, poop. And this requires three cups of flour, which is 361 grams. I'd rather that you use a scale, but right now it's kind of tough to get things like scales, zippy-like. So I just want to make sure that you're measuring your flour correctly in a dry measure. So I fluff it first. I also get to see if, for some reason, a critter got in there. And then I'll fluff it, and then I will gently, gently put it into my cup. What often happens is that people will put the whole cup into the flour and pack it down, and then you are putting far too much flour into your mix. And what happens is you'll get something that's very tough. You'll get something that um, is very stiff. The only time I've ever realized that this is something that was a good thing was with my grandmother's uh, Christmas cookie, Springle. Do you know Springle? Oh yeah, I love Springle. So Springle, my yeah. grandmother's Springle would break your teeth. And that's the only way we liked them because that's how mm. Omi made them. And it's because you use so much flour, and at that time she didn't have a mixer, right? So if you use a mixer, it will burn your mixer, <laughs> like the motor <laughs> dies. And I had a student once who had a recipe from her grandmother, I think who came from Austria, and it was a honey cookie. It was one of those roll cookies. And she kept making it, it was never right. And she said, I can never get it hard like my grandmother had it. And I'm like, do you mean crispy hard? And she was like, no, hard hard. I'm like thinking, well, with honey, it would be like a humectant. It should right. be soft. I what did your grandmother it. do? Yeah. I said, well, send me that recipe. She sent it to me and I made it. I'm like, this is a lovely cookie, it's very soft. I'm like, so I don't understand. So I did a little research in Austria at that time, turn of last century, what would they have been using? And maybe slightly harder flowers. And then I asked, I said, well, did she measure? And she said, kinda. And so I made it by adding too much flour and I made it by over kneading it, mm. creating too much gluten. And I said, this is what I think happened is that your grandmother might not have been the best baker. So she made a really tough cookie. Right. So try it, and she's like, it's perfect. <laughs> like, it's because that's what she remembered. That was like the memory, is that texture. And that's like my Omi Springle. That's what we all want, is those that's memories, what, The right? memory. But this will be a memory that does not break your teeth. So that's my three cups of very carefully measured flour with a dry measure. Otherwise, get a scale, 361 grams, a tablespoon of baking powder, and then a teaspoon of salt. What kind of salt do you use? Do you have a preference? Uh, Non-iodized. Non-iodized, because that can create a very off taste, right? Right, exactly. Um, I actually use sea salt, so I tend to use a little more than I indicate to use, because it's slightly less salty. Oh, yeah. And Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, is that a lot of people do not put enough salt in breads. Or they mm -hmm. feel that they don't need to. Um, and you usually, do you usually taste your dough for salt? Always. Always. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's a not tough time. Not during isolation baking. Okay. Right, not in isolation baking. He's not, we're not testing anything unless it's baked. But, but salt is incredibly important. And some people just feel like they don't have to add it when they're baking. So that's the dry ingredients. It was a tablespoon of sugar, a teaspoon of salt, and a tablespoon of baking powder. And I'm just mixing it up to disperse the leavening. And I know that sometimes you make a cake, and if you don't, make sure that the leavening is dispersed. One side of the cake will be like, whoa, and the other side will be like, oh. And then this is butter. So in the recipe, it calls for room temperature butter at six ounces. I like to use cold butter, and I grate it because I like incredibly tender biscuits. And what this allows you to do, if you are a hot-handed mama or papa, and you are working butter into flour, you can very easily start melting the butter. And if you melt the butter, then the flour will start absorbing the moisture 
that is in that butter and you'll start producing gluten too soon in the process and you'll get tough biscuits. No one likes a tough biscuit. So what I'm just doing is I'm using my fingertips very gently to rub the flour and the butter together. And so what that will do is coat some of that flour in that fat. And when it starts coating, then some of that gluten is unavailable. So this is an unbleached all-purpose flour. It has a relatively high gluten content, but you'll have a very tender biscuit because you are coating some of that flour with that fat. And now I'm going to take a cup, and take my eyelash out of there, a cup of cold whole milk. Use whole milk, you can use buttermilk. It's really hard to find whole fat buttermilk. If you can't, then you can use half a cup of the low fat buttermilk and a half a cup of sour cream that's full fat. So this is a cup I'm gonna very gently sprinkle, leaving a tiny bit behind. And I'm gonna to toss this with a spoon, like a salad. Toss, 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 toss. And I'm just making sure that the liquids and the dries are evenly dispersed. And I'm not kneading, I'm not stirring, I'm just trying to break these guys up. And now I'm gonna do what I call windshield wipers. Is I'm gonna take the dough, these clumps in my hand, big clumps, and I'm gonna use my thumbs like windshield wipers I'm not kneading this. I don't want to start creating a ton of tough biscuits. So what I'm doing is I'm using my thumbs just to knock apart those bits that are very full of moisture and combine that with that dry mix that's in there. And right now it looks very, I call this the rubbly mixture. And before I do anything else, I'm gonna do something French. So I was first doing the biscuit method where I was rubbing things together. And you're gonna learn some French now. That's called sablage, making sandy. Now I'm gonna do fraisage. I'm gonna start smearing a little to compact the dough. Thank you. We're Where did you that. learn how to do these, Kazina? I learned to do these because I am a baking nerd and I studied uh, so many books and I bought French baking books yeah. for professionals. Mm -hmm. And instead of using the American ones, I'm like, I want the old school. They were from the 70s, so the pictures were all sepia-like, yeah. right? Everyone, all their talks were like sideways a little because they were, no one cared that their picture was being taken. No one was paying a lot of attention. And it was just so lovely to see, they were very detailed, the pictures of those professional books, but also what I find really interesting now in this Instagram culture, everything looks so, almost it's very pristine but almost sanitized yeah and the pictures in there they weren't perfect they were correct but like say the Saint Honoré might not have been perfectly piped mm -hmm. but, but it the was, technique was the technique was there mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was kind of lovely for me to see that and not feel as intimidated so now I'm gonna take my compacted dough it's a little rubbly and you can pat this out, but I like to roll it out. And I'm going to do a fold. So this is what you would do for a laminated dough, where you create a fold to create layers. And I'm going to fold it like a letter, a single fold. So you kids out there who've never folded a letter, and just done an email, you fold it into thirds. We'll talk about this later, you never having written a letter. And now I'm gonna roll it out again to about three quarter inches thick. And I'm silly, I always have like an elementary school ruler around so I can tell what the size of my dough is and to see the depth of it. Now I have a couple cutters. If you don't have a bunch of biscuit cutters, you can cut, these into squares and that way you are not wasting any dough at all but also if you use a biscuit cutter and you have the extra pieces you can gently compact it back together or what I like to do is use those extra pieces and I break them up and I bake them and I use them for croutons hmm. so I also this is another trick I place them upside down the flat side up 
so that you have a perfect little flat top. And then I have that extra milk still hanging out, and I use that to brush the top of my biscuits. And then I put them in a 425 oven for about 12 minutes. So Jeffrey, we're gonna have biscuits Good. before you know it. And you'll rework that scrap? I will rework the scrap. So this size biscuit cutter, which is actually quite small, will make about 15 to 16 biscuits. Is that like an inch? It's about an inch, correct. And then obviously the other night, Ray and I, we weren't feeling so petite and we had very big <laughs> biscuits. This made like maybe five biscuits. Yeah. And we ate them all that night. So this will make you feel as if you have to parse them out a little longer. Mm. And they freeze really well after baking, which is fantastic. Hmm. So while I do this, why don't you show us what's yeah. next on the agenda? What's next on the agenda? Um, we're basically doing everything in this bread lesson backwards. In other words, there's baked stuff that I did in my kitchen at home. There's dough that's been shaped. Here's a round loaf and there's a couple of other loaves under here. And there is ripe dough that I mixed about three hours ago at home. You can see when I say ripe, look at all the nice air pockets in there. That's an indication that the yeast is alive and well. And so I'm going to divide this dough. It's very, very versatile. So I'll divide a couple of baguettes. I'll make a round loaf. I'll make an oval loaf. You can make rolls with this. You can make pan loaves with this. You can make pizza dough with it. It's really quite versatile. And the other thing you can do is not feel like you have to abide by the weight of the yield weight in the formula that's been given. You can certainly say it's just me and my partner. We don't need all that bread. I think I'll divide the recipe in half or you know, my kids love this bread, so I'm going to double the recipe. Because it's balanced, you're able to make many, many changes. So I'm cutting this to 280 grams for the baguettes. And the reason I'm doing that is because Gazina's pizza stone seems like it would handle just about that size. So there's two baguettes. Now I'll do a 600 gram round loaf. And I'll make an oval loaf with this. So I'm not going to make any hard rolls, but they're really, really yummy. And that's 550 grams. So it would be very difficult to take these two pieces and turn them into baguettes. They're too randomly shaped. So we want to bring these, all of four of them, into more of a cohesive mass. And so we're going to do what's known as pre-shaping. There's many ways to do that. <coughs> um, here's how I do it. I dry my hand, give it a couple of pats in case there's really big air pockets. We don't want to incorporate big, big air pockets. But that said, we want to be gentle enough that we're keeping some of the air pockets in there, which give a really nice texture and mouthfeel. So, I fold it in half away from me, and I pick it up, and I just start tucking it while I roll it back towards myself. Okay, That's, That wouldn't qualify to be a finished round shape, but my goal right now isn't to finish it. It's simply to bring it from this kind of irregular shape into something reasonably round. When we go to give it the final shaping, I'll be much more emphatic about symmetry. So there's that. So, Jeffrey, someone just said that they have your book and that the pizza dough that in that is the best. Oh, well, they that's nice. They love your book. I'm glad And you were doing, that. you're working on the third edition yes, right now right. of your book? Yeah. Are you stressed? No. Good. No. No stress in baking? No, I don't feel stressed. I feel good. like I'm on schedule and feels good. So now these I'm going to shape differently, these two baguettes. I'm going to shape these into blunt cylinders. So again, I want to have dry hands. I'm going to fold this towards me, slightly bring the ends in, and then watch my thumbs. I just roll down and push away, roll down and push away. It's very delicate. 
motion, you can see all kinds of small bubbles on the surface. These are fermentation gases. These are your friends. These are the good guys. So we don't want to be pressing so hard that we evacuate all the gas from the loaves. So gentle, fold about a third of it over, fold in slightly, and then one fold here, and then just, okay, that's all. So these will now take 15 minutes to relax, maybe 20 minutes. How do you know when they're relaxed? The more you bake, the more you will learn the language of the bread. The bread is always talking to you, and so what we have to do is learn the language. And people say, oh, that is so corny. This dude must be from the 60s or something, which, okay, maybe I am. But on the other hand, I've got a cat at home, and let me tell you, I know when the cat's hungry, tired, grouchy. I know <laughs> every mood he has. So we all have the ability to communicate with non-human living things, and this bread is all of the above. It is a living thing. It is. What are your feelings on refrigerating the dough at this point? Or someone had asked, can you freeze it at this point? Freezing is always very risky if you've right. got raw yeasted products. If it's sourdough yeast or um, commercial yeast, it's risky because the cell wall of yeast is semi-permeable. Yeah. That allows nutrients to flow into the environment. It allows waste products to flow back into the dough environment. And it's got moisture inside the cell. And we all know that if we fill the quart jar with water and put it in the freezer, the nature of water is that it expands when it's frozen. And so you break the glass. Well, if right. the glass is a yeast cell and you're freezing your raw yeasted products, you're going to lose a lot of the gas and power. Right. So you're better off not freezing raw products. You can certainly freeze these breads as soon as they're cool out of the oven and they'll taste remarkably good when they're thawed. Is there a point in the process where you can refrigerate, yeah. like say yeah. at the pre-ferment, yeah. at the bulk ferment? Um, yes, you certainly can. Is there a point where that is too long? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> when this dough becomes ripe in about another two hours and 10 minutes or so, or 40 minutes, I should say, um, we could shape it and then instantly refrigerate it covered and bake it the next morning. So you can have fresh bread at breakfast right. or whatever. But again, if we look at bread as a living environment, there is a life expectancy to the yeast. So right. if we either let this rise for six hours, if three mm -hmm. hours is good, six hours must be twice as good. Actually not, because the yeast will pretty much gobble up all the flour, the sugars in the flour, and you'll wind up with very pale, lusterless loaves. Same thing if you refrigerate. You can do that, generally speaking, for up to 16 hours or so, right. if there's not an overabundance of yeast. Mm -hmm. But if you tried to go two days or something, you'd wind up with, again, pale, lusterless. Yeah. And this doesn't use a lot of yeast. And a lot of people think the more yeast, the more better. And that is not the case, right? You that don't is so not the case. That is so not the case. Can we load these breads? Yeah, if you want to load them, I'm I ready think to load ready. them. I'm ready. So. I'm going to get you some boiling water. These are, this is the same exact batch that we just started mixing 20 minutes ago. Um, I mixed this at home at, what time was it? 11 o'clock. No, 10 o'clock. No, reverse that tape, Ray. This is the dough that <laughs> Gazina mixed at 10 o'clock. When I got here around 12.30, um, the dough was getting ripe. At 1 o'clock, I divided and pre-shaped these before we went on air. And so these are ready to go into the oven. Why am I saying that? Because when I press in on them, I can feel a certain amount of inner lightness to them. Uh, it's a little hard to quantify the precise feeling of it unless you do it frequently. If you're new to baking and you're not sure, it's not a cause for alarm or stress because you're gonna love the bread that comes out of your oven, guaranteed. So before x-rays and MRIs, what did doctors do? 
and felt you on the outside to get a sense of what was going on on the inside. And that's what we're doing with this bread. I'm trying to, by palpating the outside of the loaf, I'm trying to get a sense of the inner lightness. People say, shove your finger in there and it's supposed to do something or other. I'm not sure what. What did the bread do to you that you would shove your finger <laughs> in there? But the, the one reason that's not accurate is because different shapes have different characteristics. So mm -hmm. if I shove my finger into here, it's going to be different than here. So I'm just using my fingertips to get a sense of the inner condition of the dough. And this is ready. I don't want to let the dough rise 100% because well, <clears throat> that would be, for example, if I leaned over 100%, I would fall on my nose. By the same token, if I let the bread rise 100%, how is it going to rise anymore? It's already 100. It's well, probably going to and, collapse. And somebody asked that question, that what, is it overproofing then that will cause a bread to collapse a bit in the oven? It could be that. It could be poor shaping. Poor There's shaping. a lot of possibilities. Could it be poor shaping in that you left those very large bubbles in in the pre-shape and they there could, yeah, could there have could exploded and collapsed a bit? Yep, yep, yep. You'll see when we do the final shaping of the loaves that were just done yeah. that um, there'll be more vigor in my hands because every time I touch the bread, it's giving me the opportunity to bring strength to the environment. Right. And when I do the final shaping, particularly on the round and the oval loaf, um, I really want to be bringing strength. It's my last opportunity. Okay. So these are going to go in the oven now. This is a fancy thing called a transfer peel. Um, you can use a quarter inch piece of Luan. Uh, you can fabricate three thicknesses of cardboard. Um, there's many, many ways that you can make your own. Acrylic works. You can get pieces of yeah. uh, acrylic to yeah. do that as well. Yeah. This is baker's linen, also known as couche linen. It's very supple. It's lovely. Uh, it lasts for decades. Um, if you don't have it, you can buy a piece of canvas at the fabric store yeah. and just wash it a couple times so that it softens oh. up. Uh, in other words, you can adapt and adjust. Now, Here you, I've got do you flour it? So people you are can. Having... Here's flour for the batar, for the oval yeah. loaf, right? But mm -hmm. I didn't flour the baguettes. Okay. Okay, so let's see. You know what? I am going to need your transfer peel, and I can't remember where you it's put right it. It's right there. Oh, yeah, because otherwise, how am I going to get it into the oven? Yes. Right? So we're going to put all four loaves in, yeah. then we'll steam. And we're going to be loading down here, Ray, in this lower oven, because I couldn't reach up here to be loading. The Hot water's place. there. I put a little pyroxy okay. there for you as well. Okay, so what do we want to load first? Probably these guys. Uh, where's my other breadboard? I'm so here, but socially distanced from you, so tell me what you need. Okay, I will. I cannot give you an extra arm. That I cannot do. So, as per, a lot of people have trouble with a basket, right? And they think they floured it well enough, but the dough still sticks. Is it just a matter of essentially seasoning, uh, seasoning it so that it becomes almost nonstick, or is there something that they are no, doing wrong? No, it's not so much seasoning. It's um, making sure that after you've shaped the bread, mm -hmm. that when you go to put it in the basket, the surface of the bread isn't tacky. Right. Okay. Right, and that you've got ample flour. So if you have too much flour, it doesn't got look it. so pretty. So even before you put it in, making sure it's not tacky on top and That's flouring right. the basket. That's right. Okay. So here's, you know, baker's tools. These are called lames, L-A-M-E. It's a French word. It's just a thin, flexible piece of steel. And you'll see that I wove onto it um, a couple of razor blades. Curved ones are good for things like baguettes. Straight ones are good if you're cutting vertically into the bread. We want to cut into the bread to give it an opportunity to expand through the cut. So a nice swift cut there. How deep? Um, that looks like it must be about half inch. I'll go here just for decorative purposes. But now with these deeper cuts, that's going to give the bread the opportunity to expand up through there. I'll use a curved blade for this oval loaf. Because, you know, I'm going to ask you to um, pour the steam in. I will. And I think we will do some, maybe half of it. 
with this first load, and then at, when the baguettes go in, we'll get a little now? more. Yeah, I think so, as soon as I load it. So here with this one, again, if you don't have one of these, don't worry. Just use a sharp knife uh, or use a popsicle stick. Uh, you can have a straight blade, that's okay. For here, I'm gonna have an angle like this and just go right down the length. All right, let's get these in. We're doing this one? Yep. And we are going up here. And steam? Yep, just half of it. Okay, that went in at 35. Let's remember that. And now I'll get these baguettes in. What's our timing? 35. Can you put a, uh, well, we'll put a timer on when the baguettes go okay, in. Okay, good. And I think I better load these this way, right? Is that the right orientation for the other baking stone? Yes, I think the, so, it right? is, yes. Okay. All right, and I'll cut these similarly to the way I cut the batar, but I'll do a series of cuts. And I think people get Whoops. very confused in that they see it expand in the oven and they see the finished product and they feel as if they should be making uh, almost horizontal cuts. No, you right? want that, that angle so you, you get that, that flap of skin. Ready? Yep, more steam too. More steam is coming. There you go. Now I'll set a timer for? Uh, set a timer for 18. 18? Yeah. You heard that, 18. And when that goes off, that means it will have been 20 minutes for the uh, round and oval. Uh, something that I've noticed that people, because the steam environment is what is going to create that very distinctive thin, crispy crust, yep, right? Yep, and a very rich color. We and won't go into the science that causes that, but suffice it to say, the steam also gives you better volume because by keeping the loaf moist, there's more opportunity for expansion, for expansion. before the heat of the oven right. puts a crust on it. So essentially, the bread forms a skin in an environment that is dry. Right. So you need that steam to help it continue to expand. That's right. And there are other vessels as well that can help. So with the round, the most common thing to do is to do it in the Dutch oven, which is, it's actually a great environment for that. But sometimes it's very hard to get a boule in there without yeah. just dropping it yeah. or burning your hands. Uh, there is the baking cloche that actually turns that around. So it's built for that in that it's flat on the bottom and it's got the lid on top. And then for the rolls, I've used the cast iron. Oh, that must be great. And it's great because it doesn't have a great bow to it, but right. they don't rise so high that they mm -hmm. actually hit the roof of it. And it's a beautiful environment. Sure, because they get all that radiant heat. And you don't need to add water. The steam environment right. is naturally occurring in something like that. So you have different choices for the way you shape it and how you bake it. But the temperature was? 500. 500. It's a high oven. And it's better to start most of your breads, those that don't have fat or a lot of sugar in them, start them good and hot in the home oven because when you open the home oven, 50 degrees of temperature is in the kitchen in two seconds. Yeah. So if you start at 450 or 420, you won't be putting the bread into a hot enough environment. So you may very well have to lower the temperature partway through the bake, but start hot. You'll get more volume, more crust if you like a good crusty bread. And I'm a big fan of, I call it a crust you can trust. So this is ready for the next series of folds. Let's go back 30 minutes. Can you point that right in there? And you remember how there was zero resistance when I pulled on it? Watch now, just even though there's no agitation, it's just sitting there untouched, it's got miraculously some gluten development. That's the great benefit of time. So when I give the next series of folds, I do it the same way. I go down the back and stretch it over. It's almost like I'm smearing it over, but trying hard not to rip it. Again, another 20 or 25. 
and the dough will be quite, quite different than it was 30 minutes ago. This might seem like, I can never make this. I'm, I have to wait three hours, oh. and every 30 minutes I have to fold it. It's more than once that I had to do some marketing or go to the post office yeah. or whatever. I just put this in the seat next to me in my truck and <laughs> fold it when the timer goes off. It All doesn't right. need a seat belt. It doesn't need it, you know, it's not a baby, not a little toddler seat in there. So check this out, Ray. So this is about 20 strokes. And now look at how the dough is. It's, now it's starting to look and feel like bread dough. That will continue to strengthen over the next two hours. So that after three hours, yeah. it's lovely mature dough. If I decided to double the yeast, the dough would mature more quickly because the yeast would be consuming the sugars in the dough and I would risk having an overage dough. So this is a very modest amount of yeast in here intentionally because it's a fairly long bulk fermentation. So Penny asks, do you prefer baking bread in a convection or conventional oven? Um, they both work uh, these days since I'm no longer working full time. I'm doing a lot of baking at home. Yeah. And I've gravitated towards convection. So I guess that's what I'm doing now. But I think in both cases you can have really good results and all ovens are different all right? ovens are different so get to know your oven that's right all right so that's done where's my oven? lisa says i've been baking for 57 years but there's always more to learn yes lisa yes. keep it up that's absolutely true every day is a new day to learn something new in baking now then so we've done the the next fold for that how are those feeling the baguettes need a little time. These can be done pretty much now. I'm just going to dry my hands again before I do that. And I have a, a question, or actually an opinion question, because a lot of people will work their dough until they get to that elusive window. They feel yeah. like this is what I need to see, right. this unbreakable right. window. What are your thoughts on the window? Um, when I mix brioche and challah, I mixed to a window. Other than that, for a lot of reasons, which again are pretty technical, mixing to a window is almost a guarantee that you're going to sacrifice flavor and color because there's these very fragile things that naturally yeah. occur in the endosperm called carotenoid pigments. They give a really nice aroma and flavor, and they're very fragile. So if you overmix your dough, you're going to oxidize the carotenoids. Here's the image. I give you a cup of egg whites. Mm -hmm. You put it in the mixer with a whip and whip it on high yeah. speed for five minutes. And those egg whites started out kind of yellowish and now they're pure white. Right. What'd you do? You added air. Right. You can, the same thing happens if you've got good quality un unbleached flour and you overmix your dough, you're gonna oxidize these fragile carotenoids. And I'm sorry if this, if this is too technical. But they love the result it. is that you lose flavor and aroma. Yeah. And speaking of unbleached flour, if someone could only find bleached flour, um, would the results be very different? Would, like, is there something that they could slightly adjust? Well... Or should they just go with it or not do if it that's at all? all it, look, in this day and age, if there's flour in the supermarket, everybody wants it, right? So you're probably going to just have to get it. Um, but the problem with bleached flour is the carotenoids are gone to right. begin with. So the flavor is gone. And there's some nutritional deficiencies too. Correct. From the bleaching process. Well, and also what the bleaching does, it's done to make it white, right? But it also yeah. takes away some of the gluten strength and enhances some of the starches. When I'm making cakes, that can make cakes very gummy. Uh -huh. Right, if you're using uh, a cake flour. There's only one uh, cake that I make with a bleached flour. It's a bleached cake flour because it is a Japanese sponge and the texture is so specific to that flour huh. that it doesn't come out gummy, just very spongy. Huh. Otherwise, it can be terribly gummy because of that enhanced starchiness of that flour. Interesting, wow. Okay, so I'm going to shape these now, okay? They seem like they're ready for that. So um, I've got a 
Benetton or a Brot form here. This is probably at least 30 years old. Um, they're great. I owned a bakery for a long time. So I used to buy these. They came from Germany. They were shipped in burlap bags from Germany, a hundred in a bag. Wow. They cost Did you keep the bags? Eight dollars plus shipping. <laughs> I mean, including shipping. <laughs> That's so yeah, great. I guess I'm dating myself. But did you start, wasn't your true baking um, start in Germany? Uh, no, it was for a German woman. From a German woman yeah. in Massachusetts. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Okay, here's the round loaf. So it had been resting with the seams down. I've just turned the seams up. And I'm going to start again by a gentle patting of the air. And I'm almost going to repeat that pre-shaping method of folding it in half, picking it up so the seam is north and south, and then putting it on its kind of tailbone, and then just rolling it back towards me while I tuck it. I'll do that maybe three times, and now I can finish the shaping. Now, if I try to finish the rounding on a bed of flour, it's only going to slide around. I will not be able to make a round loaf. So I need to have dry hands so I don't rip the surface, but I need to have a bench without any flour. Right? So there's a round loaf. Okay? Again, we've got those nice fermentation bubbles on the surface. This is the dough gazina mixed at 10 o'clock. And this is a nice taut round loaf. So I want it to be round, tight, seamless, no rips. If I rip it, then that's a sign that either my hands and the loaf were tacky, and so mm -hmm. I ripped it, or I was too vigorous. Um, but in either case, that's a defect. You know, something that I love to see is when you watch a wonderful baker's hands, that there is such a, um, a roundness to your hands. There is a suppleness to it. Uh -huh. There are no hard angles. And that is a respect for the bread, but also, obviously also practice. But I think it's so important to watch somebody shape bread who, like you, who just intuitively knows how to handle it like a baby. And look at you picking it up. <laughs> Here, the other thing I should have shown you, what I just did is a good, fast way to do it. But if you've just got that five pound bag of flour, it's the first one you've ever had, that method might be too challenging. Another way you can do it is simply by cupping your hands together on the bench as you rotate the loaf. So kind of like this, so that the flat part of your hand comes together with each stroke. That's a very effective way. Okay, in a production bakery, you wouldn't get too far if you were shaping 500 loaves that way. In fact, you're gonna be two at a time in that case. But when you're starting out, feel, find your comfort level. And if, it, if this is where it is, stay there with it, okay? And now I better put a little more flour in here. So a lot of people, like Terry, she likes that wood sifter. Where, where did you get that wood I sifter? I got that from a dear woman who owns a bakery in Madrid. And I was teaching class, and she sold some baking paraphernalia to her customers. Yeah, um, and that is nifty. It's really nifty, isn't it? It is, and yeah. it's adorable. <laughs> it's exactly, It serves two the functions. It actually sits flour, and it's adorable. That's right. It just sits there looking pretty. Yeah, I like right? it. Okay, now I'm gonna make an oval loaf. So now I'm gonna have a very narrow north-south direction. If I were making a baguette, I would want it to be like this because I'm trying to get something this long. But if I'm making an oval loaf, I want to start this way. Start the same way. Now I'm going to bring some of this over. And you can hear that, you those can big hear bubbles. Those popping bubbles. You can Good hear them. sign. Good mix, Gazina. Six feet away, I can hear that. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to take these shoulders and just bring them in. Now I'm going to just do one fold here. This is going to become the loaf and all this kind of tag end is going to get incorporated. How does it look color-wise? They're getting there. Maybe you want to take a quick peek? Do you want to lower the temp? I did already. You did already? Yeah. I'm not that. going to take a peek yet. So okay. my thumbs stay here. My fingers have nothing to do. This is why this can be challenging, because we think we must have to do something with our fingers. Well, in fact, the fingers are just going for the, along for the ride. So I just rolled from the top down to the kind of crease, push away, go back up top, 
roll and push, roll and push. When I get to the bottom, then I'll want to fashion it into something symmetrical that has the length and the shape that I want. Some people like very pointy ends, some people don't. So that's Baker's call, really. That looks fine to me. So I'll what leave that. What do you that. prefer? Um, sometimes it's a bit of an affectation yeah. to have really pointy ends. Right. I think a lot of baguettes have pointy ends now because most production bakeries use a bread molder uh -huh. that brings it out almost the full length. Mm -hmm. So if you make the ends pointy, it looks hand-shaped. Right. Okay, so this is going to go with the seam up right here. Okay. And they'll take about 50 minutes to rise. Oh, the steam wasn't that effective. So the baguettes don't look so hot. They look pretty great. Let's see what we got here. They've got some time. So what are you feeling? Um, the, what am I feeling? <laughs> You're feeling so much. The degree of crustiness and how right. much, how much squeeze before I hear it crack. Got it. Right? Well, and another thing I think it's important to relay is that right now, obviously, in touching things, we're all very fearful, as we should be, about passing germs. And so I did a little research, and the virus at a certain temperature is killed. And it's 63 centigrade and 145.5 Fahrenheit for four minutes of cooking. So if you cook food for that long, then it's safe. Obviously, handling then thereafter would be the issue. But for bread, ideally, the, it has a higher internal temperature than that and obviously has baked a while. So it's about handling it after the bake. So as we're touching this right now, all of that's fine. The oven will take care of things that we are unhappy with. But mm. just be careful after, once you take it out, if you want to gift it to someone, mm -hmm. be careful how you handle it. Have gloves or use a very clean cloth and bag it. Um, some people are double bagging now, mm -hmm. just for safety. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to shape these baguettes, then we'll get those out. I guess they're close enough. A little flour on the bench. You never want the bread to stick to the bench. So for this portion of it, there's a little flour. Gentle pat. I'm going to fold roughly a third of it towards me. I'll turn it around and repeat. Now I'm going to just basically go down the length of it. I'm left-handed, but I'll do this the way righties do. For righties, my left thumb is close to the end, half an inch, an inch from the end, and it's going to be going right down the seam. My right hand, my fingers are behind the loaf, and they're going to fold the bread over and then press with the heel of that hand. No, actually the thumb, wait, my left, sorry, so sorry, my left hand folds the bread over so that my thumb is buried and you can see my fingers, and then I press. Walk down, Keep walking down until you get to the end. Find your seam. Put the seam down. Now we'll just contour it by having very, very soft hands. And I think that pizza stone will handle about 16 <laughs> inches, which is what that is. Find your seam. I'm going to put the seam down. I had some droopy uh, end baguettes when I was a little too wide. Now we'll do this one, then we'll get some baguettes out of the oven. How much is left on that timer, Gazina? We have 31 seconds. Okay. So for a lefty, right thumb here, left hand behind, right fingers bury the thumb, left heel of the hand, walk down, okay. find the seam, that's not so nice, 
Okay. Timer. There's the timer. That's good choreography. Yeah. So one thing that I'll point out is that you can get better looking bread out of a home oven. Oh, you got some of those already. Then you can, no offense to you, out of this oven. This oven is so big that that steam that right. we put in was not very effective. You see how matte the surface is? I baked this out of my home oven and froze it. Look at the difference. You can also see how, because the steam wasn't that effective, the bread got crusty really soon. Right. It didn't stay moist because the cavern is so big in this mm -hmm. oven compared to a home oven, mm -hmm. right? And so the bread got crusty and it's desperately trying to expand. And so it's finding any place that it can to burst out there. So home ovens can make bread much better mm -hmm. than this because they're so small that that one cup of water is quite effective. Right. Yes. Okay? So can I do one more fold? Oh, please do. Okay, because we're almost done with an hour. But we also need to make some Levin. That's, That's right. That's a wonderful That's way right. to send people off. That's right. So it's a little early yet. We still have another 11 minutes, but I want to show you the effect after the third fold. So it's six folds total. We've done two. Same stroke all the time. And again, I want to reiterate that the bread has never left the bowl, and it won't leave the bowl until it's time to divide it. Jeffrey, I need to ask you this question. Donna asks, do you ever worry about arm hair getting into dough, i.e. pizza dough, because Italians are so darn hairy? <laughs> Thank you, Donna. That was a good uh, one. <sighs> actually, um, I used to worry about things, but it's not worth it. It's so not I, worth I don't it, worry. Is it? Yeah. No, I don't worry also because um, your arm hair will not come off. Right. Okay, when I was working with the French, my first baking job, we would make Genoise every Monday in oh. a 60 quart Hobart. We'd stand on a milk crate and beat the eggs and sugar. Right. And then when it was warm enough, we'd put it on the bowl with a whisk. We knew it was ready for the flour and butter when the foam had risen so much that it was above the height the of height. the bowl. Yeah. It was the meniscus that held it in. And that's when we knew. <laughs> and then we'd have it on the floor. And we'd be up yes, here. and moose that way too. Yeah, yeah Folding yeah. moose yeah. with a whole arm. And there was never a hair. That's that you not, knew of. That's not a worry. <laughs> that you knew of. That's not a worry. So, Gazina, you know that you're going to bake these, right? Yes, I'm going to bake those. Good. Let's look at that batar. That, that should be done a minute or so before the round, simply because the shape. The oval bakes a little more quickly. OK, same thing. It's very matte. You hear that hollowness? Good sign. Don't use a thermometer to take nope. the temperature. Okay. It's not accurate. We can talk about that another time. Look at the color. Look at the time. Um, thump it, and it should feel hollow, but a thermometer is inherently inaccurate, okay? And again, this bread looks a bit tortured. Uh, it had trouble expanding once it got crusty. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we got here. When I see how pale it is there, that's an indication to me that even though it sounds like that, in all likelihood, it's still got a little bit too much moisture. Mm -hmm. And if it has too much moisture, that will spoil the crust, basically. So right. this can have one minute. And that might seem like micromanaging. No, I understand. But this is the place to micromanage. Good. OK, we're going to make sourdough now. So now I'm going to put up, let's see. This is our liquid Levant culture, well, Jeffrey's. So these are the ingredients. No, I did it wrong. Uh -huh. ah. Do you mind weighing out the water for that sourdough? Yes. What are you needing? I, what is the weight measure? The weight is uh, 250 grams. You got it. Uh, temperature? Would you Just cool as cool. Fine. Okay. So here I've got some organic rye flour. Let's see. Should I wait for you, Ray? Okay. 
and it's 200 grams. I've got 10 grams of honey. That's just going to give a little extra sugar to get things kicked off. And we're going to add 250 grams of water. So that means for every 100 grams of flour, there's 125 grams of water, also known as 125% hydration. Fancy word. If you don't have rye flour, you can start it with wheat flour. The reason you'll want to start with some kind of whole grain is because there's a lot more nutrients coming from the bran and the germ. Eventually, this will be complete white flour. But to get things started, it's very beneficial to start with a whole grain flour. Organic is arguably better. Um, the honey is optional, but it does give it a little bit of a jump start. 250? 250. And you mind pulling that loaf? I got it. So this is simply a matter of mixing things together. <laughs> He's got better hands than I. So the question will arise because of the shortage of flour and the inaccessibility of things now because it's hard to get to a specialty store. Can you start this without the rye flour? Yeah, if you can't get whole wheat and all you have is white, uh, then you definitely should use that honey. It probably will take you a little longer to get things activated. But right now, as soon as you add water to flour, basically you're waking it, waking it up. You're waking up all the different chemical components inside it. The enzymes are now yawning and stretching and they're gonna start feeding on the flour. There's a lot of very deep level things that are going on starting now. This will get fed uh, in 24 hours, 24 hours later, and then if the temperature has been right, if I can keep it in an area roughly 80 degrees, then in three or four days it'll need two feedings a day, roughly 12 hours apart. Um, sourdough is a completely different chapter in baking. It's a thrilling and fascinating way to bake. Um, I made a sourdough when I was leaving my first job, so it was uh, 28th of August, 1980, and my first boss, this German woman, she said, do you want me to show you how to make a German-style rye sourdough? And I said, ooh, there might be some sourdough in my future. Maybe I will say yes. So I said yes, and I started the culture on the 28th of August, so it'll be 40 years old this year. Wow. And... What I, was her name? Susan Negla. Negla. From Stuttgart. Yeah. And boy, do I have some stories about her growing up in the 30s. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, also, growing up with rye, since my mother was German, rye is the German yeah. bread. Yeah. And it is... It's it, magnificent. It's magnificent. There is a depth to that flavor that is so specific to German bread yeah. that I love. And just, we would get to these huge loaves uh, in Nuremberg, yeah. and we would you know, illegally take them back home with us huh. because we would just slice it off in the most beautiful way yeah. to have Brotzeit at night. Yeah. Here, I've got something for you. That's the biggest tongs I've ever seen. Yeah. So are we kind of ready to say goodbye? I think we're ready to say goodbye. Well, can I shake your foot? Thanks. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> this has been such a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed doing it. Mm. We are here for you. We have a plan. So we're thinking Fridays 2 p.m. is our thing, that we are going to be, Jeffrey will be showing you beautiful bread. I will be doing something quicker and asking the questions that you are asking. And I think this will be living on, on the internet after we are done today. So you can continue asking questions and I think the King Arthur lovely people, they will answer them. Or we will answer them when we come back on Friday. Sounds good. So be safe. Mm. Bake well, mm. and we're here for you because we know that right now in isolation, not so fun, but we're here to help you bake.